Hello and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we are going to be continuing on with our Bible study series going through the book of James. I already have the videos for chapter one and chapter two up on my channel, so be sure to check those out if you haven't already. And then in today's video, we will be digging into chapter three. Chapter three is a little bit on the shorter side. The whole thing is only 18 verses. And the whole first part of the chapter is under this subheading called Taming the Tongue. This is a passage that has a special place in my heart, or really it's just ingrained in my psyche because growing up I went to a Christian school and I'm not sure which grade it was in maybe third or fourth but at one point we memorized this whole passage and then it's also a passage my dad would direct me to growing up if I ever mouthed off not that that ever happened and so this is just a passage that always stuck with me there's a lot of imagery in it so as you'll see there's going to be an analogy about a horse and then another analogy about a ship and so growing up that imagery always just really stuck in my mind and then I've been able to sort of rediscover this passage as an adult and begin to understand what it means on a little bit of a deeper level and I'm continuing to still do that. That is one of my favorite things about the Bible is that we can continue to read even the same passages again and again even ones we grew up reading and every time we read it there's more that we can learn. We can never exhaust scripture and I think that that makes it thrilling to read and so I'm excited to dig in and learn even more with you guys today. I did want to mention one thing before we get started reading. I wanted to share something I read in my commentary that is talking about the structure of this chapter, how it is basically going back and forth between these two contrasting ideas. One idea being of taming the tongue and the evil that can come from our tongues and how that produces dissension and division versus this wisdom from above and that produces the opposite. This wisdom from above produces unity and peace and all the good things. And so keep that in mind as you're reading. As always, I will read through the entire chapter out loud, stopping to share thoughts, and then we will pick one or two verses to dig deeper into. So Without further ado, grab your Bible, grab a cup of coffee, and let's dig in. Verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Yikes. So what that makes my mind think of immediately is just the weightiness of even something like this video. I wouldn't necessarily consider this video me teaching to you. I would consider this me studying a passage of scripture and inviting you along with me and us studying it together side by side. But still in that I am making a video and putting it out there where I am sharing from God's word and that is something that I don't take lightly at all. Every single time I prepare a video there is a ton of prayer and a ton of thought that goes into it simply because of this. Anytime we open God's word and share from it there is a weightiness and a responsibility there and James is saying that outright here in this verse that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness and so that can apply to something like this like what I'm doing or maybe you are a youth group leader or even in Bible study you're kind of the leader and sharing thoughts with friends when we are teaching in any way particularly from God's word there is a weightiness there and there is a responsibility there and I think that it's a good thing to be reminded of that verse 2 for we all stumble in many ways and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. I don't think I've ever actually noticed this until this time, literally right now reading this, but just that simple statement of we all stumble. Every single one of us, again, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And then James is making a connection between stumbling to our tongues. So he is saying we all stumble. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is perfect. And so he's already saying that nobody's perfect, that we all stumble. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, then he is perfect. And so really he's kind of just drawing this connection here between stumbling stumbling between sin and our tongues. Verse 3, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. In both of these examples, both with the horse and then with the ship, James is driving home this point that something very small has the capacity to steer and to direct something much bigger. And so whether that is the bit that is able to steer this entire horse or a small rider that can steer a, a massive ship that is also being directed by strong winds, that in the same way our tongue, which is a small part of our body, has so much power over the direction that we go and can guide us in these different ways. Continuing on in verse five, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. 
The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and of bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. This is an intense verse right here. And that last part of seven or eight, I think it was, connects right back up to the beginning of the chapter that no man can tame the tongue, that if anybody has, then he is a perfect man, but there is no perfect man. So it's again, reiterating this point that nobody can tame the tongue and that there's so much capacity for evil and for poison in it. This could apply to false teaching. I don't think it's a coincidence that the passage starts out with a warning to teachers. And then this could also be applied to something like gossip. Gossip is such poison to communities. Something I try to remind myself of when I'm tempted to gossip is what safety it creates in relationships when I don't. So if I refuse to gossip with a friend, then that friend is also going to have safety in knowing that I'm going to refuse to gossip about them. But yet if I give into gossiping with them, they're not going to have that same sense of security or safety in knowing that I'm going to also refuse to do that about them. And so the tongue is as this verse is saying, it is a restless evil that there's full of deadly poison and there's a lot of capacity to do harm with our tongues. Continuing on in verse 9. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This reminds me of what we were talking about last week in chapter two, how faith without works is dead. And it's not that our works earn anything for us, but rather our works are gonna be an indication of genuine faith. That if our faith is genuine, there's gonna be a natural outpouring of works. And in the same way, here we are seeing that with the tongue, that what comes from our mouth is gonna be an indication of what is in our heart. The Bible says that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we can say that we are blessing God and that we are praising God, but then if we are turning around and cursing somebody who is made in his likeness, then James is telling us right here that that should not be so, that both cannot flow from that. It's sort of like the apple tree analogy we were talking about last week and, you know, saying, well, yes, I'm an apple tree. Yes, I'm an apple tree, but really that tree is sprouting forth grapes. I don't know. And continuing to claim that we are an apple tree, but really the fruit is showing something different. And so this is saying that if we are claiming to be people who love God, yet we are cursing the very people that he made, then that's like trying to claim that we're an apple tree when really our fruit is showing that we're not an apple tree. It's producing grapes. And then that verse, verse nine, where it's saying that with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and then we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. I think it's helpful to think about a parent and their child. My brother has a little girl my niece Abby who I love and adore and I'm obsessed with her if you watched James 1 you saw her at the very end of the video because she woke up from her nap and I'm just thinking if somebody were to say that they loved my brother and that they thought he was awesome and that he was great and then they turned around and spoke horrible awful things about Abby that just wouldn't jive right because my brother loves Abby he loves his daughter and God loves his children and so it doesn't really jive when we say that we love him and we worship him and we bless him and we praise him and then we turn around and our hearts are full of hatred or jealousy or gossip or bitterness or judgment towards other people and as I'm even saying this I am convicted because I know I've done this before and this challenges me to want to make sure that every single person I'm looking at that I'm truly recognizing that each and every single one of them is a human being who is made in the likeness of God who he dearly loves continuing on in verse 13 who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So now here we're entering into the second subheading in the chapter that's called wisdom from above. So again, we've got this contrast from the tongue and the potential for evil that can come from it versus this wisdom from above. And so I want to pause here and read something from my commentary on verse 13 that was really helpful to me. It says, meekness comes not from cowardice or from passivity, but rather from trusting God and therefore 
being set free from anxious self-promotion. So we're going to get into this more here in a couple verses, but another sort of antonym to wisdom from above is this self-promotion. Self-promotion and the evils of the tongue are grouped into the same category that bring about division and dissension. And I loved this statement from the commentary because this is saying that meekness, it's not being cowardly, it's not being passive, but it's really coming from this place of trust in God. And when we truly trust God, we are set free from having to anxiously self-promote ourselves or make sure that we're going to be enough or that we're going to get ahead or that people are going to like us or that we're going to be cool or good enough or whatever. But when we truly trust God, we're free from having to do that. And we're not driven by this self-promotion that really ultimately leads to division. Also, I would read from the study Bible again, but it got pretty heavy last time. So I'm just going to pick it up when I need it. Verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. I want to pause here again and read another thing from the commentary that is really just helping to define selfish ambition because ambition in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but selfish ambition is. And so I want to read what this commentary defines it as. It says, selfish ambition is a divisive willingness to split the group in order to achieve personal power and prestige. Verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. So this selfish ambition, this is not wisdom from above, but instead it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That is an intense statement. Again, it's not just saying, yeah, that's not really a good thing. It's saying that that type of selfish ambition is demonic. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be every disorder and every vile practice. So again, that type of selfish ambition in our hearts, it only brings about disorder, it brings about jealousy, it brings about division, it brings about bad things for a community of people. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above, this is where we get into the good part, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, that mercy we talked about in chapter one, and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I'm gonna read that a second time. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Can we just point out really quick how much the same themes run through the entire book of James and really just scripture as a whole because there's so many other places in the Bible that connect to what he is saying in just this one sentence. He's saying that the wisdom from above is pure. I think of that Philippians verse again to think about whatever is pure. It is peaceable. It is gentle. Those are both fruits of the spirit, open to reason, full of mercy. We were talking about, I don't know if it was chapter one or two actually, but how mercy triumphs judgment. That was chapter two, it looks like. And then it is full of good fruits. So if you watched my John 15 video, we talked all about how spending time with Jesus and staying connected to him is ultimately the only thing that can produce good fruit in us. And the good fruit can be the fruit of the spirit. It can be a love for truth. It can be bringing people to God. And so all of those things come from this wisdom from above. And then it is impartial. We talked all about that in chapter two to not show partiality to certain people over others and sincere. And so all of these things come from this wisdom from above. And I just want to point that out too on that note from John 15, that these are not things that we can achieve from our own. These things flow out of a relationship with God. So again, it comes from those roots, that connection to God and the fruit is the result of that. And then verse 18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so Really, it's saying that peace is contagious. If we seek peace in our relationships, if we are our peacemakers in those, then a harvest of righteousness is gonna be sown in peace by those who make peace. So that is James 3. I love this chapter. There's so much here. I honestly wish we could do a deep dive on every single verse. And if you have the time, I honestly encourage you to do that. But again, for the sake of not making this video five hours long, I'm gonna select verse 17. I'm gonna go ahead and grab out my journal and we will dig in. I wrote out that verse, verse 17. 17, and then if you can see here in the column of my journaling Bible, I wrote out some of the notes from the commentary that I read on camera and how I do this. I explained it more in my how I study the Bible video, but I try to keep stuff that's here in the columns of my Bible evergreen. So if I'm more so journaling or talking about something I'm going through at the time, that will stay in a journal like this or just a regular journal. But I try to keep anything that I write here be something that is going to help me understand the passage more at any time. So it's not just specific to what I'm going through or that time, but it's something 
something that is again evergreen so it's going to apply in any season or any time and so that note from the commentary was really helpful for me so I did write that in my journaling bible and then I'm actually going to copy that and write it down here as well. So I wrote out those two notes from the commentary again, meekness comes not from cowardice or passivity, but rather from trusting God and therefore being set free from anxious self-promotion. And then two, this definition of self-ambition from the commentary, which says it is a divisive willingness to split the group in order to achieve personal power and prestige. And then I also wrote down in caps here, the big idea we talked about in the beginning of the video. So it is danger of the tongue versus wisdom from above. And I like that that kind of sort of maybe not really rhymes, but anyways, I'm gonna highlight that because it's a big important idea. All right, if you've watched my videos before, you probably know what's coming, but I want to look up these different characteristics of what wisdom from above is. So it is first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, and then impartial and sincere. I wrote down those definitions. I tried to write them kind of small, so I still have room for application, but I'll read through them quickly. So pure, free from contamination, gentle, mild, kind, tender, reasonable, having sound judgment, being fair and sensible, merciful, compassionate or providing relief, fruit, result or reward of work or activity. I want to come back to that one. Impartial, fair and just, sincere, free from pretense or deceit. And again, that kind of echoes what we were talking about in James chapter one and deceiving ourselves. And so this is saying how wisdom from above that it is going to have these characteristics. And so if we want to know if our wisdom is truly from above and not, as the verse says, earthly, unspiritual, or demonic, if we want to know that it is from above, it will have these characteristics. I am going to spend some time down here in the application and prayer sections, as always, thinking through personal applications and praying on this. And then the note I wanted to make on fruit is fruit is a result or a reward of work or activity. And so these things, and like I mentioned that we talked about in John 15, that these things are not something that we can conjure up on our own, but rather they are the result of an activity and that activity is spending time with Jesus. It makes me think of a Lisa Turkers quote I really like that says, I want to live a life where people can tell that I have spent time with Jesus because the reality is when we spend time with him, it produces fruit in our lives that make him known to the people around us. So that was James 3. One thing I wanted to point out about application is that part of the application comes from what we just did. It comes from studying scripture and seeing, okay, how can I apply this to my life? And then part of application and it simply comes from storing the scripture away in our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can bring it to remembrance in the moment of need. So that is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is that as we are studying scripture, as we are storing it in our hearts and memorizing it or even just getting familiar with it so that we're thinking about it throughout our days, part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has taught us in his word in the moment of need. And so a practical example of that is a couple days ago, I found myself tempted to sin. And in that moment, I thought of the verse that we had just been studying through and reading through from James chapter one, a couple weeks ago, where it is talking about how each person is tempted when they are enticed by their own desire. And that desire, when it has fully grown, gives birth to sin. And so it starts with that little desire, that temptation that when we give into it leads to sin. And yet Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he has empowered us to not have to do that, that we are free to obey God. And so it was in that moment that the Holy Spirit brought that verse to remembrance and I was able to turn away from temptation. And so I just wanted to encourage you in that because as we're applying things, there is that practical part of it where we're pulling out things and saying, okay, how is this showing me areas that my life isn't in line with scripture and what changes can I make to reflect what I'm reading? But all of it is God. All of it is his work of sanctifying us. And even if you might not see a practical, tangible application right away in the moment that you're reading scripture, know that in reading it, you are storing it away in your heart and the Holy Spirit is going to bring Bring those things to remembrance in the time of need. And that might be a situation like that where you turn away from a temptation to sin, or it could be a moment where you're really discouraged or where you're lonely and he calls to remembrance a verse of encouragement and of comfort. And so we're not always going to see the application
application in the moment, but it's doing a work in us now and it's continuing to do a work in us even when we walk away from that specific time of reading the Bible. God's word is alive and active and it is making us look more like him. That is James 3. Please leave a comment below letting me know which verse stood out to you most and why, what you are learning as we're going through this series. I love hearing that. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and then also hit subscribe if you haven't yet. And I will see you back here next week for James chapter four. Bye.